Welcome to Run With It, the podcast that brings you business ideas from established entrepreneurs. Each episode, you'll hear a new business idea and the exact steps our guests would take to get started. Follow through and you can earn a free mentoring session with today's guest and potentially a business partnership. Here are your hosts, Chris Justin and Ethan Janney. I'm Chris Justin. And I'm Ethan Janney. And in today's podcast, we have Steve Benson. Steve is the founder and CEO of Badger Maps. After receiving his MBA from Stanford, Steve was Google's enterprise top sales executive in 2009. In 2012, Steve founded Badger Maps, a software company that helps field sales people optimize their routes and schedules to save time and be on time so they can sell more. Steve is also the host of Outside Sales Talk podcast, where he interviews industry experts on their top sales tips. Steve, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Ethan. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's really wonderful to have you. We're going to kick off this episode with something new that we're trying out, loosen up the tone here a little bit. Could you just jump in with either your worst or your first business idea? Well, my worst or my first business idea is actually probably the same thing. So (laughs) when I was 13... I had figured out that uh, I could import fireworks into my home state of Illinois. I grew up in Chicago uh, and fireworks are illegal to sell in Chicago, but they are legal to bring in either by driving them in or by mail. And uh, oh, I figured out, a, it's actually legal to do it. Yeah, you could you could legally order them. They could they could mail them to you, but you okay. couldn't. You, there, you couldn't have like a fireworks store in Illinois. Uh, I'm not sure what, what the laws are like now. But I had figured out that I could order whatever fireworks I wanted off of like, and this is obviously pre-internet, off of uh, um, there was like paper order forms. You'd like fill out a form and mail it into this place and they would send you a box of fireworks. I got some personal consumption and then I, I figured out that there was a nice market at my junior high for, uh, for these fireworks. <laughs> I started a little, a little fireworks channel business where I uh, would order the fireworks and then I would in big boxes and then I would kind of break open the boxes and sell the fireworks one piece at a time. And so I would sell like a bottle rocket for a dollar, but a whole, you know, 144 bottle rockets I was buying for like $7. So the margins were pretty sweet. It wasn't a great business idea because um, I actually never got in trouble for it, but I could have, and someone right. certainly could have blown their hand off or something. And there, so there's a lot of legal liability there, but, uh, but that, that kept me in, uh, I actually made a ton of money on that when I was like 13. It was, it was, it was a good little business. It was crisp, but you, you know, it doesn't scale and there's legal liability. So I'm going to call it my worst business. Like <laughs> That's awesome. I remember driving from Chicago and you'd enter Indiana and it would just be, yeah, it'd just be like warehouses, fireworks, buy them here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But my, but you know, we were, we were all 13. So my, my market couldn't drive to Indiana. They were, they were captive. I also remember being a 13 year old playing with fireworks that we shouldn't have played. <laughs> <laughs> and your hands are still intact, right? <laughs> yeah. I, got them. I imagine that made you quite popular, Steve, to have a giant box of fireworks available. I mean, I think people knew I was screwing them, but you know, so I don't know. but yeah, I think people, people were happy to do business with me because there wasn't another source. You know? <laughs> Well, from that point, that's the start of your entrepreneurial journey. You have made quite the... Uh, start with a... You have to do the pun there. Start with a bang. Start with a bang. <laughs> <Start> bang. <laughs> you right. <laughs> Built from that experience to this amazing company and Badger Maps. And we're going to talk about that more in the end of the episode. You'll probably be able to bring it up a little bit during the conversation. But this podcast is about new business ideas that our listeners can take and uh, get started on their own. So what is the idea that you would like to share with our listeners? The idea that I'd like to share, and I think it's a good one because as an entrepreneur, I I need this right now. Basically, so some people may be familiar with the concept of the Salesforce app ecosystem, right? So you can connect to Salesforce and then they have like an app store that you can then advertise your uh, product for, etc. And there's an API that you can connect uh, into Salesforce. So why do people use this? If you create an app for a company, a lot of times the company's data about their customers and a lot of other things are in Salesforce. And so you want your... Or, or whatever CRM you're using. And so you want your app to be able to connect to that CRM. And so you have to kind of maintain 
the connector and the way the two pieces of software talk and communicate as people use it. So one of the reasons Salesforce is such a popular CRM is that they have this ecosystem of applications built around them. It's not too, too hard to build a connector to Salesforce and kind of now your stuff can talk to theirs, their stuff. Similar concepts like the Apple App Store on the consumer side. But what the idea is, is creating that same ecosystem, except it doesn't just connect to Salesforce. You can connect it into lots of different CRMs. So you basically build a hub. It's kind of like a hub and spoke model where you create a hub and a company like mine who creates a piece of software connects to that hub. And then that hub connects to, you know, the 20 major CRMs that are floating around out there, Salesforce being one of them, but, but there's lots of others too. There's Microsoft Dynamics, there's Pipedrive, there's Zoho, there's HubSpot, yada, yada. There's 20 of them. There's probably, well, there's probably 100 of them, but there's 20 probably that are really important. And so then an independent software vendor, SaaS player like myself, could then connect their software to this hub and, that, and then be connected very quickly and easy, easily to all these other CRMs. I'm imagining almost like a Zapier type of thing, right? Yeah, there are companies that are similar to this, but not exactly going after this market and not focused on it. And often they, like Zapier connects, you know, anything to anything, basically. Anything to anything, right. This is more specific to the world of CRMs. uh, And so it's more specific to business software. So there's MuleSoft that, uh, that Salesforce acquired I think they might have done something like this, but now Salesforce acquired them. So they're not going to do it because Salesforce isn't in the business of enabling the rest of the CRM ecosystem, right? There's a company called uh, Cloud Elements that does something like this, uh, Cloudless that does something like this, but none of them are super focused on just this. Where, you know, if, if someone put a laser focus on, on this, I, th- I suspect there's a lot of value to be unlocked. Yeah. And when I say Zipier, I mean that kind of modularity where you can just take things that are, you know, not that it's like the Zapier actual company, but it's that it's like Zapier for integration of, of CRM with, with other apps and things like that. And I feel like one of the cool things about this is that it's a sales related business project. And I feel like, you know, without a doubt, those are the ones that have a lot of leg. Whenever you can help people sell more or facilitate sales, then there's high value there because it's really clear to see if there's results or if there's a return on investment. Well, driving into that a little bit more, the status quo right now, let's say you wanted to integrate Badger Maps with a different CRM. I imagine that's a time-consuming and expensive process. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So if you want to integrate, and I'm, I'm not an engineer myself, but I, I have a, a team of four guys that basically does this. We have a database basically on our side, and most pieces of software, you know, are interacting with data in some way. And then Salesforce has a, has a database as well. And so, if someone is using our software and they make a change to their customer information, say they change the phone number in our software, right? And they do that on their iPhone. If you're connected to Salesforce, then it'll also update in Salesforce. The phone number will be correct in both places now. If you didn't have a connection and you were just using us and you also had a CRM, you'd have to update it in both places. You don't want to do that, right? So you want you want your other pieces of software that you use with your CRM system to be connected to your CRM system. And it's a pain in the butt to, to do to, to kind of set up the and maintain the connecting the connecting point between these two pieces of software because both pieces of software are changing and a company that makes a piece of software to do a thing their core competency is not going to be building a connector and maintaining a connector ecosystem with all these different CRMs. So this idea is kind of proven out, you know, in that there's 5,000 companies or something that are connected to Salesforce's CRM system and they're on the Salesforce app store. It's called the app exchange. And so you basically just be enabling all these ISVs to do this with Microsoft Dynamics and Zoho and everybody else, all the other CRMs. How much do you think it costs you per year to either develop these connections or maintain them? Um, that's a good question. I think it kind of depends on the level of complexity. Some people, you know, if someone was just 
sending pretty simple data back and forth and using like Zapier or something, probably not very much. If you are connecting a database that has multiple tables in it, it's more. You have to have, you know, engineering, several engineers to maintain that and build it out. And, and, and it's, uh, it's not something that you, even if you're doing it the easy way, you're probably going to be doing it with Zapier. I mean, you could, just, you could also do it. You can connect things, you know, kind of in a, in other simple ways too, but those aren't nearly a, a, as good. Meaning you can have like a daily sync or something where you have one piece of software send the other one because the SV file and, and update all the things, but that's not as good of a solution. A, it's not instantaneous and B, well, I guess that's really the big problem is it's, 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 it's one, two problems. One that's one way and it's also not instantaneous. I'm guessing something like this doesn't exist, but I feel like it should. Not the actual idea, but like a universalized standard for like client information, something like that, right? Like a lot of people who have clients, like to give an example, okay, right, you said name, phone number, stuff like that, email address, you know, position, things like that. A lot of people will use the same terminology, but they'll be different throughout different applications. And then there are things that have to do with the sales process, which may not be standardized across different platforms like invoices, right? Invoices, like every business needs invoices, but each one's got its own little way of putting them together. If you could take the time to put together the sort of database, like the database fields that are common among clients, just to be able to say, okay, let's bring these in and you can assign this goes to this, this goes to this. this. There's sort of universalized fields for business, you know, CRM, contact management, stuff like that. I think that's like a, just even developing that as a foundational step of, you know, what are the common fields and can you just sort of define them and then just match them in from different services, right? Yeah, I think that's kind of what this would be able to do. Because right now they're called different things in different places, but we know what we call, you know, let's just call it an account, for example, or we know what we call the address field. And we would need to connect to this one thing, this one hub, and then it already knows we tell it this is our address field and it's like oh okay that's the address field well we know where the address field is and what it's called in all these 20 different crms once you connect into the hub it's pretty easy to string everything else together how much is that integration to salesforce worth to you would you say well it's worth a ton because any company that needs to be interacting with customers data and if their customers data is stuck in salesforce or stuck in their crm I mean, not that it's stuck, you, they want it there, right? That's one of the main purposes of the CRM is to be the repository of the company data. You need to have that connector for your product to be useful to these clients. You can't do it without it. But right now, you know, there are several products that we can kind of use that are imperfect for this because they're not focused on it. Or we could build it ourselves, but that's not our core competency. It, it's better to have one company build it for all, you know, one company to build it for a thousand companies rather than each of those thousand companies do a bad job of building it. And imagine that if someone laid those rails, then it would also make it easier for ISVs, independent software vendors, to launch their product because they wouldn't have to get over that hurdle of, yeah. of building the connection that's essential. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and there's a lot of simple little apps out there that can create a lot of value, but it's not something that like, you know, a lot of these companies are just connected to Salesforce because it's the biggest player in the CRM ecosystem. And so it's kind of the first one that you would connect to. And, but it's a company is bringing this value to Salesforce, but you know, so it was the first one that we brought, right? So we help field salespeople map and route their customers. We brought that capability to Salesforce, but we still aren't connected to Insightly CRM, right? But Insightly CRM, there's a lot of Insightly CRM users that, that have a field sales team that would, would benefit from our stuff. They just can't use our product with Insightly right now because we haven't had the time yet to build out the Insightly connector. And so, you know, if you go on Insightly's like community forums, there's people asking questions like, hey, why, why can't we use this? Why haven't you guys built this connector? And it's like, well, it's hard. (laughs) 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 Or or they'll ask Insightly like, hey, why don't you guys have this capability? Like I, my old company had this capability on, on Microsoft Dynamics. And we're like, well, yeah, we built the connector to Microsoft Dynamics. We haven't built it to this one yet. There's 20 little CRMs, right? And they're all kind of specialized on different things. So different companies want to have different things. Like Insightly could be a much better solution as a CRM than for a company than another, another CRM would be. And so they, they were right to choose Insightly. It's a great CRM. 
But Salesforce has a big advantage over Insightly in that because it's larger, all these ISVs bring their capabilities to that platform first. And so that's, that's what building this platform out would bring both to the Insightly customers and to the ISVs. You're just, you're enabling it, laying the tracks, like you said. So I'm sold on this idea on, uh, on it being a problem and, and uh, the solution that you've outlined. We took a little bit longer than we normally do to walk through that, but I think that it was warranted because it's a little bit more technical than some of the ideas that we've had here on the show. The question that immediately comes to mind then is, uh, why hasn't someone filled this need? I think someone like MuleSoft would have, but Salesforce bought them. So there's a problem in software where, you know, companies it can be acquired. And then if, if they're kind of a general tool, but one company acquires them, then they're going to repurpose them to just be useful to, to their ecosystem. So I think there are a lot of connector type companies, but none of them have really focused on this. Like no one said, we are the, we are the CRM connector company. The closest that come to mind are cloudless and cloud elements, and there's a handful of other ones. But like, I think people generally tend towards connecting more and more things. Like Zapier, you know, I, I don't know what their tagline is, but if I were going to make it up, it's like connect anything to anything, right? But if someone was like, we are, we are like the Salesforce app exchange except for all other CRMs. I think that that's no, no, no one's gone after that kind of positioning and space and had that focus. Definitely for small businesses. I mean, I did some research in trying to start a certain software project and definitely saw this problem come up over and over again. And it's, if it's affordable, I think it's really easy to sell to certain small businesses because you have a lot of small businesses where they pay a secretary or an administrator to literally, okay, the data comes in, make sure you put it in there, make sure you put it in there, make sure you put it in there. Oh, for sure. Um, or, or they just don't connect them at all, right. and they have two places they're storing information, which is bad because one is always going to be stale. Right. And I not we have we have a ton of customers who use both us and a CRM, and they're not connected. And one of the other is going to get updated. The other, you know, and the others get stale. And the worst thing is that you know, oh well, like imagine you had Insightly CRM and Badger, and your field sales team they're all using Badger in the field to collect data and to keep track of things because that's what we're for, right? And, and, you know, we help them plan their day and everything. But the marketing team is using the CRM and dumping the new leads in there. And so now you've got to get your new leads from Insightly to Badger. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the individual sales reps can have to do that by hand or, or get the same data that was uploaded to the CRM and uploaded again into Badger. And then when they update it and work with it, the data, it, now it's going to be not, it's going to be stale in one place or the other. And so you end up with like two places that are both being updated. What, what, what ends up happening is both places end up stale and, and being updated, but not with everything. And so it's, it's the worst of both worlds. To answer Chris's question earlier, I think part of the reason that stuff like this doesn't happen is because when you start a business, a lot of times you have to but it's wise to start with the larger players, right? So if it's like, oh, let me let me build a connector service. Who am I going to start? Let's start with Salesforce, right? <laughs> so then, yeah. So then they started with that. Is there a reason? Well, first of all, and maybe that leads us into some action steps to getting into that a little bit. Who would we start with? Would we ignore Salesforce? Is there like a secondary player in in CRMs that we would start with? One thing that keeps coming to my mind, I'll just throw it out there. As a small business owner, I'll have like, just simply, I'll have like Google contacts mm -hmm. and then I'll have, I don't know, Google contacts and MailChimp or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like I have contacts in my contacts. I have contacts in my MailChimp. They're the same people, but they're not all integrated. And definitely if I update one, it's not going to update the other. Right. And you're using Google contacts as a CRM, which I don't recommend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't use it. I don't use it as a CRM, but it is really nice to be able to, type in somebody's email address and it, or type in somebody's name and it fills out their email address mm -hmm. so they get to run, type it through, through Google if I'm sending it. But I think that a lot of small business owners are going to be in a situation where they have like something like that. They're doing like doing some messages through Google, some messages through like a MailChimp. And then also they have an accounting software like, mm -hmm. like QuickBooks. Like I feel like a QuickBooks has the ability for apps itself, but maybe there's a way to kind of do something like that. Yeah, you can get oh, QuickBooks would be the type of thing that you'd want to connect this to. Exactly. 
so it's not a CRM, but some people use QuickBooks basically as their CRM. And so it would make sense to connect those two. I'd love to get into some action steps. I think uh, it'd be worthwhile to talk briefly about the value of the solution, because again, it's something that maybe a lot of the listener does not have experience in this field directly. Mm -hmm. So you had mentioned that the market size here, it's greater than 10 billion in total addressable market. Mm -hmm. If you were to try and ballpark the value of a company like this, how much it could be worth, take a swag at it. What would you, what would you say? This is probably, I I imagine this will be built and I imagine this would be a, a standalone public company. This is a big business and it's it's probably something that you'd raise venture capital for because you, you know, as opposed to bootstrapping, because you'd you need to have a lot of engineers for something like this. There's an up a big upfront upfront investment to build something like this. But definitely worth in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. I mean, this is a big yeah. company. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you you could get this to 200 million in revenue and go public. I, I, you know, in a real in five years, I'd say. Because there's a lot of ISVs out there, right? Like, I mean, just go through the Salesforce app exchange, right? Like, and you can look at them and be like, okay, well, this one I can, I can get this value here. And oh, go figure, I can't get it on Insightly. So it's easy to find who you're going to sell this to. Like, it's not, it's easy to identify the buyers because you're unlocking a lot of value. It's going to be a relatively expensive piece of software, right? So you can charge for it based on number of transactions. You could also charge for it based on number of end users. So if someone's charging, you know, let's just say the average app on the app store is charging, you know, 15, let's say 20 bucks for easy numbers, 20 bucks for their app, right? It makes a lot of sense that if you were the connector part of that is worth a dollar, right? So if you're going to charge a dollar a seat to do the connector piece, and so per month, so a company that has a hundred seats, something's going to be paying you a hundred bucks a month, just to maintain that connector piece. There's a, a ton of apps in the app store. Let's just say there's, I don't know if there's five or 10,000 of them like that are real, you know, companies that have more than 10 people at them, like real companies. Maybe there's 5,000 that are making more than a million bucks a year in revenue. So if you were able to capture one twentieth, which would probably be pretty fair to, for the connector piece of that value, you get to a pretty huge number pretty fast. Awesome. You know, as, as you're talking about how these get connected, I'm, I'm feeling that maybe there's a space for just creating the centralized hub that other apps can build an easy connector to. So it's like, you don't like as a company, you don't have to learn all of the unique apps, but you can say, here's the dictionary, right? We have the dictionary of all these things. If you can plug in from one side and this other app is plugged in from the other side, then now they can communicate and, and you just push our button. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to. That's exactly how it works. You wouldn't have to, if you created this, you wouldn't have to connect Badger Maps Mm -hmm. to you, right? You give Badger Maps the tools and our engineers connect to you, but then you are maintaining the connectors between you and these 20 CRMs. And you you could start with, you should start with five CRMs, right? Not 20, you know, start with the biggest five. And and I would do Salesforce too, because Salesforce, they have this app store, but like, you have to build your own connector into them. And so probably you, the hub would be just as useful there. So you'd have one for Salesforce, one for Microsoft Dynamics. You'd have one for Zoho, a connector for you know Insightly and HubSpot, yada, yada. This is one of those ideas that as we're doing the podcast, I'm like, uh, let's just call it right now. And let's, uh, I'm going to take this and build it. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's exciting. Well, this is, I mean, I would have done this myself, but uh, you know, I'm already busy, busy running a company with 70 people at it. So we, I've already got a thing. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a thing already. So I'm busy. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good leeway into action steps, some more action steps. So let's say you didn't have Badger Maps. This, you decided this was your, your next project. What would you be doing you know, tomorrow, the next week, the next month to really get started? Yeah. If I, let's just say that Microsoft bought Badger Maps tomorrow. I'm, I am, they don't need me. They've already got, Business guys floating around there, a plenty. So they're like, Steve, how much do you want? Do you want to just put it out there, just in case they want it? <laughs> <laughs> they, they know where to find me already. But my uh, my biggest competitor just got bought by Salesforce this past year for uh, two fifty. So awesome. Salesforce has has uh, has their own mapping and routing solution now, and uh, so yeah, like you know, the other CRMs like Microsoft may may decide that that they want this. 
which is a good example of, of why this hasn't been the thing that we're talking about hasn't been built yet because if it starts being built uh, one of the crms are very acquisitive right it's very competitive very big market and so they if someone builds a cool thing in the crm ecosystem a lot of times it does get snapped up by oracle or microsoft or salesforce etc and uh but let's just say yeah. so you get snapped up you get snapped up and then tomorrow you get to work on this new project. Okay. What are the first things you're going to do? Um, first things that I'm going to do, you know, so I have a little advantage here in that I've already been the customer. I am the ideal customer profile. So I know that person really well. I know what it looks like, but even being me, I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to have to validate basically that I'm not missing something here. And so I'm going to, I'm going to probably t- try to talk to 50 or a hundred guys just like me, like me today. Right. Uh, who have an ISV that connects to, to uh, CRM systems. I'm going to find them by going on, I'm going to look at the, the Salesforce app exchange and figure out who the biggest players on the app exchange are, you know, the, and uh, start reaching out to them and, you know, have a conversation about, well, how are you, know, you guys doing really well on, you know, you have, looks like you're making 5 million bucks a year selling in the Salesforce app exchange here. Are you thinking about also integrating with Microsoft and Insightly and, Zoho and all you know the other twenty CRMs and maybe their answer is yeah we already did it it's really easy you just use this tool and then this isn't much of a business idea that I've just laid out here but if they're like yeah obviously I'd like to do that I mean it's just you know that's hard to integrate with these things we bust our ass all day keeping the Salesforce one running and you know that's the biggest ecosystem so we just never been able to take our eyes off that that ball and and build it into these other ecosystems and maintain it in these other ecosystems. So yeah, I mean, but I mean, it would be great if we had such things that would unlock all these other places, right? I'd love that. So you talk to them and basically it's just seeing if the business idea has some legs. Yeah, I'd want to gut check it because I could be an idiot, right? Like, I think this would be useful, but maybe there's some reason that, you know, they're, they're like, no, I only want to do business on Salesforce. Nothing else matters. I don't care that it's only 20% of the market. That's all that I care about. Right. Uh, or maybe they say, oh, yeah, that's easy. I could do it like this. How did, you didn't know about that? You're an idiot. They're like, oh, I'm an idiot. Sorry. I'll, I'll go home. Don't worry. I'll just, sort of <laughs> I'll, I'll just sit here by the pool. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, that's, that, that would be step one is to talk to as many people like this and be like, hey, I'm thinking about building. And, and if they do gut check it out and say, and they, they're like, yeah, that'd be great. Then I'd start you know, talking to them about, well, and you know, this is what it would cost if I were to build such a thing and have a basic version that would connect into these three CRMs. Um, and I'd give you access to those markets going forward. Uh, if the thing was done, done in six months, do you think you'd be interested in buying it for this price? And if their answer is, hell yeah, then you get yourself a business. If they're like, mm, no, I don't think I don't think so. Then you'd want to ask why. why. Why wouldn't you do that? You'd find out why it's not a business or why you'd have to shift the idea a little bit. We've outlined this process before in a couple episodes. I want to call back the uh, David Hauser one and David Cristello. They uh, presented very similar frameworks for, it's called idea extraction, pulling that idea and validating it from uh, some of our customers or potential customers. So the listener can go back to those episodes if they want to dive a little bit deeper into that concept. I think it'd be really interesting. We haven't talked too much about how one can approach venture capital and get venture dollars for something like this. At what point do you think you would be ready to take this idea to a VC and try and get some money? I bootstrapped Badger... So I'm not the best person to speak on venture capital and, and how that ecosystem works. But in general, I think they like to see you have some traction before they make an investment and you'll get a much better valuation if you're able to get some traction before they make an investment. This is a little tricky because you're going to have to build something pretty meaningful before you get you know revenue traction. So I would try to build some piece of it first. So you know maybe I'd try to pick three CRMs other than Salesforce and under the assumption that there's a whole bunch of companies that would be willing to purchase just that because it would get them access to like the next three after Salesforce are probably like SAP and uh, Microsoft Dynamics and Zoho, let's just say. If you built it a connector into those and then approached companies that were on the Salesforce ecosystem, and you know, they had their own Salesforce connector, you could approach them and say, hey, you know, you guys are on the Salesforce ecosystem. I can get you access to this one. And then I'd build the thing. The minimum viable product here would probably be 
And maybe it's even just one of them. Maybe it's two of them. But you're telling them the dream is that I'm going to have 20 of them next year. But for starters, I'm going to get you access here. I'm not sure if you just had one, you'd be able to get them to actually do it. But the second you have two, it's easier. To, it becomes easier to connect to your thing than it would be to connect to. They can build their own connector. Like I built a connector at Badger originally into Microsoft Dynamics and Salesforce. If someone at that point just had something that was like, well, you connect them to this and you'll already be connected to both of those things. I would have rather done that. So if you, if you just picked Microsoft Dynamics and SAP's CRM, for example, then now you approach these guys and you're like, well, you build one connector, you get access to two. And by the way, I'm going to add through a third to a 20th. So you can probably get some traction if you build a basic version of this, you get it up and running, you get, get your first you know, 15 customers, maybe you're making a million bucks a year. Right around then is probably when I'd want to approach VC. Now, that being said, you're having to build a meaningful thing before you're approaching venture capital. So you're probably going to want to do an angel round or have your own money or, uh, or something at that point before you do this. This is, this is hard to fake it till you make it because you, you need a pretty meaningful piece of enterprise software before you can really sell this to people. Any sense of from just from your experience in building software on, you know, the budget that somebody might need, maybe the number of engineers or if it's even more than engineers, what kind of people are good to have on a, on a team to get something started? I mean, my guess for something like this is that you'd need a, at least four engineers and one UI UX designer working for six months to a year to have an MVP of something like this. So you can get there. I wouldn't try to build it in the Bay Area, but, but you know, building it in a lower cost market from an engineering staffing perspective, you could get there on a million bucks in seed money. I can see how you have maybe there like a, le- a team of less than 10 and, you know, they can, they can all be paid like a reasonable amount to get started along with maybe some equity share or something like that. Oh, for sure. Yeah. You'd want to equitize them. What about approaching a uh, startup accelerator, like something like Y Combinator or there are tons of them out there with this idea? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I did uh, two accelerators with Badger Maps. I did Stanford's Accelerator Startups and I did the Alchemist Accelerator, which is like a SaaS focused start- accelerator. And um, I thought they were both fantastic experiences. And I, and I came in with more experience than a lot of people. You know, I'm, I'm an old man, so you know, a lot of gray in the spirit. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think... Uh, and, I, and I had a business background and, and had worked at IBM and um, software company called Autonomy and then years at Google. And I had an MBA coming into it. So I, I, I had a, a background in this stuff already. And I still really got a lot of value out of those uh, accelerators. You know, they, they take a small percentage of equity. Um, well, Stanford actually didn't. They just, they're, they're free. But most of these accelerators, the business model is they, uh, they take a small percentage of equity and they, they, give, you a, they give you great access to networks and uh, especially networks for fundraising and uh, hiring. And they kind of give you, put you in, drop you in a batch with 15 other people people who are kind of at a similar stage answering similar questions. And so you can help each other out and bounce ideas off each other. And they've often built up resource libraries of, of a bunch of useful stuff for someone who's, who's starting out a business like this. So yeah, if, if I were doing this, I mean, I might not do an accelerator because I've, I've done this before now, but I would recommend to anyone starting a business who has not... Basically anyone I'd recommend join an accelerator. It's not going to hurt you. Now, is YC really expensive? Yeah, I think they take a nice a nice piece of your butt, but um, a lot of them aren't nearly as expensive as, as that one. But, you know, giving up a little equity, if being a part of the accelerator materially raises your probability of success, is it worth it? Even if it is, you know, I, I think YC is like 7% or something, which is which is a lot. Yeah, it's still probably worth it. You know, I think we got a, we got a good amount of, Foundational action steps, sort of bootstrappy action steps. We got some action steps around like VC, but maybe just to top it off and then wrap it up. Any tips from you on like looking for an accelerator, applying to an accelerator? Any tips from your experiences there? Yeah, I mean, I'd I'd say uh, applying to an accelerator, knowing people who have gone through it before is good. They like references and and people to vouch for you, you know. But ultimately, I think accelerators weigh who they let in 
very similar to the way uh, VCs determine what investments they want to make. It's just you can be a lot less mature for an accelerator. You want to kind of have a, a when you approach the accelerator, you you know a big they kind of view, view a big part of their job as as being able to bridge you and get you to a point where you can raise a VC round. And so you kind of want to be showing them the same types of things that a VC round a, a VC would want to see to give you a round in four to six months. So kind of hey, here's here's where we're at right now. Here's what we're going to be doing in the next four to six months to get us to this point. And at that point, we'll be ready to raise a VC round and kind of be able to show the financial metrics, the, the you know, the plan, the uh, what you're going to accomplish with the product over that period of time. And and don't be afraid to show what you're really looking to get out of the out of the accelerator. To sh- so be willing to show where, where where you're maybe not as strong. So maybe you're like, well. I think I've got a great business idea and a great plan, and but I really, I, w- I really want help on customer development and helping to. On I, I don't have a background in sales, for example, or marketing, so I really would like to learn from this accelerator how to approach customers uh, in the right way to get them to convert and, and actually purchase my product. Or maybe you don't feel as strong in the financing side, and so you want to. I, what I'm looking for this accelerator out of this accelerator experience is to develop an understanding on how to approach VCs and how to how to structure my pitch to them in a way that's going to make them attracted to uh, to my business and want to invest in me. Things like that. Uh, an accelerator is like well, that's really our wheelhouse. That's what we we're here to help you do that. That's so you you're a great fit for the accelerator. And if they like the business and the plan, um, I think that that kind of that, that makes you an attractive candidate for them. That last piece, it reminds me of Shark Tank. Mark Cuban, whenever he hears an idea that he likes, he wants to understand what it is that they think they need help on. If the uh, pitcher can't clearly articulate that, then oftentimes he says, like, you're, you're just here for the commercial. So it's kind of interesting to hear your perspective on that. It's very similar for, uh, in the VC world. One final topic, if, if you've got time, uh, before we wrap up here... When this episode is released, don't know what the economy is going to be looking like. How do you think about starting a business like this in the middle of economic uncertainty? I think uh, a time of economic uncertainty is a is a great time to start a business. It's easier to hire great people to work on it with you. Your opportunity cost is lower. It's the same reason as so many businesses are started by twenty four year olds who just graduated college, right? Like. It's not because 24 year olds are smarter than 40 year olds. It's just that 40 year olds, it's often not a great time for them to start a business. You know, they got kids and a mortgage and, and two dogs to feed. And, uh, and it's just, it's a harder time in life. Whereas a lot of 24 year olds are, their burn rates low. They're already living in their parents' basement. Their opportunity cost isn't nearly as high because the jobs they have access to aren't as good. And so they take, it, it's less of a risk for them to start something. And so things get started and things work out. And, uh, and so a lot of great companies have been started by, by people in that age group. And, uh, I think this is, uh, a bad economy is similar in that, you, you know, you're kind of, it can be a great time to, to start a company because you and everybody else, they don't have as good of things to do anyway. So that, that's, I, th- I think it's a fine time. Great. Yeah, I think that's a, a great answer. We normally end with uh, what's one thing you want our listeners to take away from this conversation? It may be what you just said. <laughs> uh, if you have something else, feel free to, to share it. My best piece of advice to someone starting a company um, is understand the, the unit economics and how to get revenue. How are you going to... I, I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs don't understand sales well enough. It's important to really understand where you're going to get your first customers from how are you going to walk them through understanding the value that you're creating in exchange for money? If you stay focused on customers and talking to them and understanding, you know, what you need to do for them and in order for them to give you money and just stay focused on, on the dollars coming in the door and the sales being made, that's the, the secret to, uh, to surviving and, and, and starting a small company and getting something off the ground at the early stages. Great advice. Thank you so much, Steve, for the time. It's been a pleasure speaking with you here. To the listener who likes this idea, 
don't do it because I want to. But <laughs> no, seriously, take uh, take some action. Follow through on the steps that Steve outlined here. Email us at update at runwithit.fm with what you have done. Everyone who responds will gain access to a private Facebook group of action takers. You might be able to find a co-founder there. And one lucky listener will earn a free mentoring session from Steve and potentially a uh, business mentorship in this idea. Steve, turning back to you, where can people go to learn more about you? Well, um, you know, our website's badgermapping.com. That, that's where you learn about what Badger does for field salespeople. Uh, best place to learn about me is probably LinkedIn or to reach out to me is probably LinkedIn. Just drop me a note and let me know where we've quote unquote met here. <laughs> my, my LinkedIn's a little bit of a mess right now, but let me know if I can be helpful to you in some way. And the name of your podcast? Oh, uh, the podcast is Outside Sales Talk. Uh, so if you want to hear the sales thought leaders talk about how to be a better outside salesperson, that's a great place to, uh, to learn that sort of thing. Great. Sounds great. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much, Steve. Looking forward to continuing the conversation later on and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. It's been great to meet you guys. Now it's time for you to run with it. Follow through on the action steps discussed and email a summary of what you did to update at runwithit.fm. Every listener who emails us will gain exclusive access to a private Facebook group of action takers. And one listener will earn a free mentoring session with today's guest and potentially a business partnership. Help us build the Run With It community of generous entrepreneurs. Please like, subscribe, and review us online. And remember, the secret of getting ahead is getting started.